Hi, Philip Lamel here, president of U.S. Term Limits, and you're listening to Dream Chasers, interviews with the future. All right, so let's jump into LinkedIn because I feel like that's where, if you're not already doing it for your brand and your business, you are completely, completely missing out. If you're sitting there playing on Snapchat and playing on Instagram and doing useless social garbage, you are missing the business opportunity of a lifetime because it's the best demographic, psychographic, household income. It's the real place where businesses run. 630 million people, most of which are asleep and they're in consumption mode, just waiting for you to come along and make incredible content. This is Dream Chasers, episode 64, with Brian Wallace. Hey guys, what's going on? I'm Adam Carswell, and welcome to Dream Chasers, interviews with the future. On Dream Chasers, we interview individuals with supernatural amounts of potential based on early success in their careers. Thank you for tuning in. Now let's get straight to the interview. Hey guys, this is Adam Carswell, and today I'm joined by Brian Wallace. Brian is the founder and president of Now Sourcing. He's the host of Next Action, and he's also a LinkedIn Live coordinator, which I'm really excited to learn about that today. Brian's originally from Brooklyn, New York, meaning he was, he'll tell you, just basically born there. <laughs> Went to Binghamton University. Brian now lives in beautiful Cincinnati, Ohio. Brian, thank you for being on the show. And do you have any opening remarks for my listeners? Pleasure, Adam. Uh, I would say buckle up, listeners. We're going to go through a whole bunch of stuff quick because I'm used to being on podcasts and run my own that I do everything in a 15-minute clip. So I, I try to speed everything up New York style. But like you said, Adam, I try to play it cool and be in the Midwest and not go 100 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually a very interesting point. I, I feel as though every time I'm on the phone with someone who is from the East Coast, in particular, that tri-state area, the conversation is, I don't know if I want to say on another level, because sometimes going slower is a good thing. Um, you definitely got to be ready to think a little bit quicker than maybe you're used to if you're not from that part of the world. Yeah, New York, and I'd say general, the East Coast area, or that whole corridor, it tends to be extremely industrious. And I think if you look at the cost of living for some of those places, you, you kind of have to <laughs> do that or you won't survive. So I believe that a lot of that is actually out of necessity or perceived necessity because right. you are allowed to move to other places like myself, case in point. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I, then I actually just want to flip it, flip it back. Then what, how does it become the fact that San Francisco is the most expensive place to live in the U S right now? Well, if you also look at all the stats, uh, the greatest GDP producer by city is actually New York city, which is about 1.7 trillion, which is just about the size of if you put LA and San Francisco together. So California overall is bigger than New York in their economy, but that's because there's a much larger population. I think also if you look at some stats, lots of people actually want to leave San Francisco because you think that, oh, wow, there's all this wonderful opportunity. And there is, but I don't really ascribe to the theory that software is eating the world and building an economy based on only one dimension of commerce. So they're so over-reliant on tech, as opposed to a place like New York, where you feel like you always have to step it up a level, because guess what? There are more tech workers in New York than the Bay Area. There's 255,000 tech workers in New York, bigger than anybody. Take a look at the Google building out there in the Flatiron Chelsea district. It has more square footage than the Empire State Building. It's almost like the Empire State Building on its size, but bigger, <laughs> right? And that's just Google, yeah. not to mention... Uh, the fact that New York is like ahead of the pack in terms of things like fashion and the stock market and finance and all these different kinds of things. It's, it's truly inspirational to have had that as part of a background. And you can't get the kid out of New York, let's face it. And I go back there a, a fair amount myself. So um, as much as I love the West Coast and don't spend a ton whole lot of time out there, but do plenty of work with a lot of folks out there, I enjoy the well-roundedness kinds of conversations that you could have with New Yorkers. Everybody has their yeah. place to play. So, you know, I'm not really advocating for one type of thought over another. I think that regardless of where you're from, where you go, where you think about and where you travel, it's good to just participate in a good global discussion and understand where everybody's coming from. Yeah, yeah, I really agree with that. Getting experience from different cultures ultimately adds to who you become as a, as a person, as a professional, etc. And uh, that's, in, that's an interesting point there you made about um, the tech pros and in New York, because it definitely doesn't get the glory for being a, necessarily a technology city like San Francisco does. So, uh, all the while, there are still more tech workers. Look it up; it's ridiculous. People don't make <laughs> a big talk out of it, a big deal out of it, but it's absolutely true. Well, you know what I'm going to need, and guys, this is also how I first discovered Brian. Is uh, Brian? I'm going to need an infographic showing me that 
that New York is uh, more tech oriented than San Francisco? I've thought about putting it together. A lot of times people say, you know what, Brian, I have a great topic for an infographic. It's like, yup, so do I, buddy. <laughs> I have lots of thoughts all day. The reality, though, is we can't just sit around and make fun pieces for ourselves without having somebody commission it because we keep very busy and there's always people from all over the world that are hiring us. So I'm sure that sooner or later, we will have some important New York initiative where I think we'll have a chance to visualize everything that we've started just touching the tip of the iceberg on. Good point. Yeah. And so guys, Brian and I, first, well, I should say, actually, we first connected when we were introduced to each other through a recent Dream Chaser, Olga Kirschenbaum. Go ahead and go back and listen to her interview. But Brian is also heavily involved in the PR sphere, the PR realm. And I would say, based on what I've seen, maybe the, the king of infographics, very good at, at what he does. Uh, his company, Now Sourcing, has been around for quite some time. So um, we like to focus on younger projects here, Brian. You can tell us a little bit about now sourcing, but I really want to get into what inspired you to start your podcast. And then also a little bit more about this LinkedIn local thing. I've, I've seen it on the platform before, but I really have no idea what it looks like when it actually takes place. So um, that was like three questions and one there almost. We'll start with uh, how long have you been doing the three things that I mentioned? Sure. I th and I think your third question has two pieces because there's LinkedIn Live and there's LinkedIn Local. Let's start. Let's do first things first. So I started this company with, with my wife and co-founder just about 13 years ago at the recording of this podcast. We started as a social media agency back when there was no such thing as a social media agency. And when I saw that everybody and their mother thought that they were great at social media just because they could tweet something, I said, wow, this uh, isn't going to work anymore. I can't be everything to everybody. Jack of all trades, master of none is a nice thing to see on a billboard for a homeless guy on the side of the street. I think today people are, and rightfully so, demanding of great service, but also great results. So I wanted to be world renowned at a very narrow down niche of things as opposed to just trying to be everything in the Chinese sampler menu. It just doesn't work. About a decade ago, we dove right into infographics. Again, when infographics were barely a thing, there were probably a handful of people on earth when we started. But rather than be everything to everybody, we are end to end. So we come up with the concept for the infographic. We do all of the research in house where we come up with something that leads on emotion because that's how people make decisions and buy. But then we back it up by all the stats and facts that are impactful. We design things, and I don't mean bathroom symbols off of the Starbucks bathroom, but I mean actual hand <laughs> drawn design and character illustration and really impressive stuff. We then implement and test it, and then we get it all over the place in all the PR stuff. Uh, a few years ago, we got a basketball player, a $64 million contract by reshaping the way the NBA thought about him. We've helped companies get funded and acquired. And every time we step up to the bat, we get all sorts of press raining down, making people happy all day long. So that was the first part. Um, I think you also asked how I got into this in the first place, right? Yeah. yeah and actually, I, I should say this too. Um, we might as well do it. Sure. It's time to step into the next level chamber. When did you realize that this was something that you wanted to take to the next level? So I've always been attracted to, so I've been professionally on the web for about 23 years now, my first decade or so in technology and then escaping technology primarily because I didn't really like the way that people communicate there. And I thought I had more to offer the world on both the left and right brain, what makes people tick, how people think, how people buy, and just a lot more of the neuroscience and marketing and just the deep down understanding of all that kind of stuff. I really thought that there would, once I saw this, I said, wow, we're great at telling stories. We're great at visualizing and we're great at crashing servers and making things go viral and getting things all over the news. So this just seemed like the perfect fit for a guy like me that easily gets bored just doing like the same thing over and over and just boring stuff where everybody's already done it. So I always like to be really innovative and try to figure out what people do next. Speaking of next, you asked where next action came from. <laughs> so, right. Yes. Good job. <laughs> thanks. So transitioning into that, that's just something I do on the side. Um, comes out every Wednesday, usually when I'm behaving myself. <laughs> Otherwise, if I'm traveling too much, it might take a couple days. But it's basically like we call it a 15 minute catapult into greatness. I feel like a lot of people are stuck in a rut or they plateau and they're not objective about their own life and where they're going. So a lot of times 
I'll have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and I'll try to mentor them. I'll try to talk to them. I'll try to help them see the light beyond their four walls and their tunnel vision. So rather than talking one-on-one, -on -one, I said, wow, well, I think this would really be impactful if we have these archetypes of different people. And then we just have conversations all over the place. People have yeah. liked it so far. I don't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, it's something that kind of bugs me. But right now I have like the one hour rule, meaning booking a guest, talking about what we're going to talk about, recording it, very minor editing, and putting it out there to the world. We spend an hour a week and that's it. I like it. I, I, I like it for a lot of reasons, but I do want you to continue a little bit more about um, LinkedIn local and LinkedIn live. And if I can remember, we'll go back to some questions about next action. You bet. So, all right. So let's jump into LinkedIn because I feel like that's where if you're not already doing it for your brand and your business, you are completely, completely missing out. If you're sitting there playing on Snapchat and playing on Instagram and doing useless social garbage, you are missing the business opportunity of a lifetime because it's the best demographic, psychographic, household income. It's the real place where businesses run. 630 million people, most of which are asleep and they're in consumption mode, just waiting for you to come along and make incredible content. So along with being just a LinkedIn evangelist and all that, there's really kind of two main things that I'll talk about here, aside from the whole content creator community. One thing that started about, I think, two, two and a half years ago was something called LinkedIn Local. There were a number of people, LinkedIn users from around the globe that wanted to get to know people behind the profiles. So they said, let's just start making some informal meetups and we'll call them LinkedIn Local. Now, I think it's been in maybe like a thousand cities all over the world and over a hundred thousand people have attended. And it's amazing because you can just roll up whatever city you're in anywhere in the world. People are talking about it. So rather than a lot of these crappy networking meetings that nobody wants to be a part of, now at least you can rally around a point where we're excited about LinkedIn, we understand its potential, and we can cross-pollinate both our in-person audience of new people that we just met, people we already know that we're reconnecting with, along with the whole greater LinkedIn community. People from LinkedIn themselves watch this kind of stuff, and other people who either organize or participate in other cities and other countries also are very interested in it. So if you ever do a content search on LinkedIn, if you just do hashtag LinkedIn local, you'll see a lot of that. So I was not one of the founding five people that started it, but I've been very involved in it Pretty early on, we made a, a whole infographic talking about all that. We've helped get it popularized in the press. And I myself have taken part in probably a few dozen ones, whether I am organizing it, hosting it, moderating, speaking, helping put people together, some capacity, probably a few dozen of them throughout the country and a few throughout the world. And so is it still a, a project that is run by the people, for example, that have put it together? Or has LinkedIn actually taken the initiative as a as a company to get involved and integrate themselves with what you guys are doing? It's a great question, Adam. So I would answer that it's somewhere in the middle right now. So a few months back, LinkedIn said, hey, um, it's kind of our copyright. And there's a whole, and we can probably put this up in the show notes. If you actually do want to put together a LinkedIn local, there are certain terms and conditions and disclaimers that you have to have now. So that's kind of buried in the LinkedIn notes, but it is now not controlled by those people and is controlled by LinkedIn. As far as an overall communication strategy, I feel like that's something that is still evolving where it's sort of in the middle. So people know that LinkedIn owns it, but it's still kind of independently organized. If you think almost like how TED and TEDx work, but not quite that formalized yet. Okay. Interesting. And now switching, oh man, <laughs> so many questions, right? Uh, switching back to, before I forget, to the Next Action podcast, I like how so definitely the unique factor of your show is the fact that you're having conversations with people, one-on-one -on -one conversations, you're just recording them and broadcasting them. For our listeners today, can you explain a little bit, maybe use an example episode that comes to mind of what your show looks like? Is it like a coaching session or what, is it, what does it normally sound like? So I'm not a coach, even though a lot of people say I should be one. And I say, look, I am already, I have a big family and a big agency to run. So I don't also have time to be a coach. So it is more of popularizing a one-on-one -on -one conversation. One of my early episodes, for instance, talks all about a keynote speaker, but also just the vulnerable side of that. So keynote speakers aren't just booked constantly. So we talked about what he's doing in the meantime. And part of the time he's driving Uber, he was working in a pizza shop, doing all these different kinds of things. So I think it's important for people to see that we're all human. We all struggle through things. And 
other people can come into your life and help you transformatively. So we talked about on that episode, how to be known, how to get your name out there, how to get more speaking gigs, calling a line out for him if anybody was listening, getting things more active on LinkedIn, all these different kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. We want to get some publicity for whoever this this individual is, because that, t- again, ties into my next question. What was his name? And then also, have you seen people come onto your show now? And then after publicizing the show, have significant amounts of success because of joining you? Excellent question, Adam. So his name is Chris Strub, S-T-R-U-B. Really cool guy. I actually just saw him at a social media conference uh, just a couple months ago. So we got to hang out. He was famous for Snapchatting in all 50 states, and he wrote a book about it. He just came out with a movie on it. So I I love the trajectory of him, and he's just got a heart of gold. Really wonderful guy. I definitely recommend you all connect with him. Second part of the question So I've had really nothing but rave reviews on what people think about the show. People are very positive and favorable toward it. The only question that people have ever asked me is, or suggestion, is basically what you just said. What if you had people come back on the show after they've achieved something? Now, Mm. it's not even a year old, right? We're at maybe 35, 36, 37 episodes or something like that. So I think it's still pretty early for people to kind of jump into the stratosphere. And I already said, I only spend an hour even recording the show, let alone promoting it. So I think it's it's not a big fancy famous show yet because I really don't have time to get into that. And I know I'll just, it'll be like such a pet project time suck for me. I just don't want to spend the amount of time on it. It has occurred to us, maybe we could do like a comeback on the show, second season. I feel like everybody who's been on, we've been able to help impact But I can't tell you, oh, we've grown this person's audience X percent and now they're retired on the beach or whatever. I don't think life usually works like that anyway. Yeah. And in regards to um, time, to me, it's clear, you know, you are daily learning how to master and control your time better and better. I think that's probably just a, a journey that we all go through throughout our lives. To me, you strike me as someone who is perfecting that craft better than most. What are some of your hacks? What are, what's, what are some things that you do to make sure that you get the most out of your time that you have breathing on this earth? So I hate the word hacks. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, <laughs> you have to tell me why you hate that word too. I think because I think everybody's looking for stupid shortcuts as opposed to doing the work right. You can do things mm-hmm. right and then not have to rebuild it all the time. So for instance, for the last decade, I've perfected the world of infographics as a campaign to get people ridiculous amounts of re- results. I'm sure you've seen a lot of people that just, they're constantly just riding the wave of life. So every year they're just reinventing and redefining themselves. And I think that the amount of time that we spend redoing everything is a waste. Why not just get really good at stuff and then just continue to get better? So I think that that's what I mean by that. Everybody who's always like, oh, come on, just show me the overnight success. It's like, look, buddy, there's something called the 10,000 hour rule. It takes like 10 years to really attain mastery at something. So it's not always worth your time to do that. That being said, um, let's talk about segmenting one's time. So sometimes if I want something to happen, even if it's just for my own creative space, I'll just put it on the calendar. Also, I use technology to get in the middle of that. If I have to spend 20 minutes per person to go back and forth, what number should I call you on? When are you ready? Blah, 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 blah. I just use Calendly. Here's my link. Go book it yourself. One person out of 500 will be like, I don't like being your own secretary, but everybody else just does fine. So today alone, I have, I think, 12 meetings scheduled on the calendar. That's like, that's way more than people do in a normal life. Absolutely. What do I do? I have people book their own time. I usually do 15 minute meetings and people are like, how can you do it in 15 minutes? So what do people usually do? They go have coffee or whatever, right? So now I got to leave my office, go 15 minutes somewhere, find parking, sit there, listen to somebody, shoot the breeze, have coffee, and then spend too much time going on and on about nothing all these pleasantries. I I mean, I'm not a rude person, but it's like, I don't have all, no one has all day to just go through the motions, get to the point people. Maybe that's a little New York speaking, but Hey, we're right for a reason. So, and then I got to drive back to the office and then I kind of catch up on all the email. So before you know it, I've gobbled up two hours of my life when all that crap could have been handled in 15 minutes. So if everybody shows up on time and we don't talk about the weather and the sports team and whatever garbage, you could probably do a whole meeting in eight minutes. So it's done. And then let's say I have five meetings in a row. 
If the next person is late, the person before them gets more of the time. If the next person's on time, oh, sorry, guy, it's time to go. And then people are like, oh, wow, that's really organized. Why didn't I think of that? I'm like, hey, feel free to steal it. It's not mine. So if you want to call that a hack, that's fine. But I just call that a better prioritization of life. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. And you're validating one thing that I like to say a lot about, uh, I'll tell people about having a podcast and, and doing what we're doing right now. We're exchanging what I would consider valuable information that I normally would not have access to or even think about if we weren't taking the time to do this. And so um, one thing that I'm instantly seriously considering in my head right now is shortening my my meetings from the traditional 30 to 15, because you're right. I mean, oftentimes you can accomplish so much in 15 minutes and people don't realize it. So thank you for that. And then also talking about the whole getting coffee thing and, and face-to-face meetings. Uh, you know, there is obviously certain value in face-to-face, but again, you have to know in advance, like, okay, is this going to be worth it? Because one thing that I've also picked up from uh, Hunter Thompson, who had my business partner, who <laughs> we're going to have a little meeting after this phone call anyway about, yeah. um, he once told me w- within the past year also, because I think I was trying to introduce him to someone or something, and he's like, please, um, you know, just in the future, just take note that I prefer and really only do phone calls. Um, I don't do lunches or face-to-face meetings. And part of the reason being he's in he's in Los Angeles, so traffic is insane. And then two, it's, uh, you know, for the most part, you can still accomplish over the phone almost everything that you would accomplish if you were sitting in the parking lot, having coffee, driving back to the office, etc. So I would say just thank you for, for bringing that point up to our listeners. Yeah, for sure. And it's just math, right? So how many hours do you want to work a day? How many hours do most people work in a day? Let's say it's eight. So if you have 30 minute meetings and prep before them, after them, whatever, how many meetings can you really have? Especially if you're in LA or New York, it's impossible to get everywhere, right? You're lucky mm-hmm. to get in half the meetings sometimes. When I was in New York recently, I couldn't go to like the last three meetings of the day because a helicopter crashed. <laughs> and then I finally get to the meeting like an hour late. I'm like, oh guys, I'm so sorry. There's a helicopter that crashed um, and it's totally stuck in traffic. You don't see that every day. And they're like, actually, Brian, there was a helicopter that crashed yesterday. So you do see that every day. So I'm just rolling my eyes. Now, granted, the place that I was going to was like a major tower skyscraper of New York City. So this was no small time meeting. But that's being right. said, I mean, everybody that you're paying attention with, as you have their time and focus, you have to make them feel like they're the only people in the world. So put your phone away. Don't mess around. Do, don't do other things. Because the thing that I will tell people, whether it's eight minutes, 15 minutes, a half an hour coffee thing, five hour meeting, whatever it is, you should make it that your first impression and that meeting that you have with people is unforgettable. How are you going to stand out? And regardless of what you do for a living, do you show up to give? Do you show up to serve? Do you show up to have true utility? Are you prepared to connect them with lots of people? And don't get me wrong, as much as people might think that I'm nice or whatever, I don't take crap. So if I think that all you're trying to do is use me all day and be a time and energy vampire, (laughs) you're not going to get too much more of my time after that. If I just pigeonhole you as a user and all you want to do is reach into my pocket and steal $100 bills. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that good thing to be aware of. And I think that's another skill within itself is being able to identify what someone's motives are. Emotional intelligence is highly underrated. Yeah. All right. So we got three fun questions now to close this out, give everyone a chance to get to know Brian Wallace a little bit more. I'm going to give you the three questions and you can answer them whatever order you want to here, Brian. Uh, First one is because you're so close to it. I got to know because I don't really, I can't say I have many favorites about this place. Just because it is what it is. But what is your favorite thing about Kentucky? Uh, Second question is, what is your favorite thing about growing your spirit and spirituality? I know that's one thing we talked about before the call. And then uh, number three is, I would say, besides the uh, NBA player, because I know, well, I've I've heard that story before, so I want to hear something new. Besides Tobias Harris, who has your favorite client been? Oh, wow. Those are some things that are going to take some time. (laughs) <laughs> my favorite thing about Kentucky. So my wife and I got to check out Kentucky for the first time in August of 2001, two weeks before 9-11. We actually had to come out for a health thing. Then we came back to New York and the towers fell down and we're like, huh, I don't like that so much. So mm-hmm. eventually we started our own business and New York's so expensive and everybody's in a bad mood. So for me, it, Kentucky, although I haven't lived there for a number of years now, just represents a different kind of home where it exposed me to a a whole other way of thinking, a whole other lifestyle, a different appreciation for life. Kentucky and basically like everything south of the Mason-Dixon line, it's sort of like a, it's the gateway to the Midwest and the gateway to the South. 
there's a certain level of politeness. I remember one of the first weeks I was out there, I was trying to make a left-hand turn to go to a grocery store and people who were going straight stopped and waved for me to go on. And being from New York, I didn't really understand what that meant. But there, so there's a different level of politeness and just different social mores, right? right? So I thought that that was really cool. What else is cool about there? I could go on about that for quite a while. Um, if you're into any, like being a naturalist or geofining or you like the outdoors or anything like that, not saying that like I'm big into this, but I always appreciated the country out there. So Louisville is very much a metropolis, but as soon as you go a little further out, like it's Kentucky, man, <laughs> let me tell you. So I've seen some of the different bourbon distilleries, really cool country out there. Uh, Mammoth Cave, which is the largest cave system in the world. I'm kind of a wimp when it comes to like super caving, like I'm not like an Iron Man or whatever, but I thought that that's a truly wondrous part of creation. So that was really neat. Nice. All those things are really cool. Uh, if you don't like bourbon, you're kind of forced to. <laughs> so that's kind of neat. Uh, yeah, so it just it just showed me like something that's that's quite different from New York. And I think just being like a, a rarity standout, like being a New Yorker in a completely different place, or being a Kentuckian in a completely different place, is just really interesting interplay of how people work together. That's how I'd say on the first one. So then you were asking about spirituality. So yes. half my life I didn't grow up religious and half my life I have been religious. So I am a connector of worlds where I feel like I really know how to walk the line when it comes to spirituality, individuality, not like preacher, force you to believe my God talk over the other guy. So I know how to talk in terms of spirituality, purpose and intent that whether you're the biggest raging atheist in the world or the hardest right wing, whatever, you're still probably going to enjoy my way of communication because I study communication a lot. And the thing that's important to me to explain that to people is to be accepting and really universal in messaging, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. It's, uh, it's kind of, as I've heard before, standing on the edge of the coin, the three sides to the coin type of thing, not heads or tails, but that, that line yeah. in between, and then being able to make a decision from there. Yeah. And I would say the edge of a knife as opposed to the edge of a coin, because it's more dangerous. Because if I say something the wrong way, I can isolate and be divisive or make you feel bad or make you feel good. So it's a, mm. when you try to communicate on multiple wavelengths and truly help people to understand the song of the universe, there's a, a lot going on that you have to really variate and process. Nice. Okay. Well, if there's anything that we can talk about when I come on your show, that's definitely a topic I'd like to cover. Yeah, for sure. Uh, certainly, if you're kind of struggling or stuck in that, we can. Oh well, I, I, pick that up. I'm always I'm always working on on perfecting. Um, oh, that's right, because we're working on taking next action. Well, I want to I want to exactly. keep getting better at it. I, I, I identify as a very spiritual individual. For sure, per perfect is the enemy of the good. So we're not trying to be perfect. We're just trying to do better. And that's all we right. really can do in this life. So you also asked about the third Fair thing, which is what am I? What's my favorite? Man, that's like saying like, what's your favorite kid, right? So over the course of the past decade, you have to understand I've done thousands of infographics for every industry you can imagine, everything from Adobe to Twitter and everything in between. Um, I feel like there was a moment where I was very excited about the upward trajectory, right? So in any hero's journey, or if you're watching like Will Smith in the pursuit of happiness, he gets the internship and then there's the upward lifting music and all that. So I'll tell you about a moment when I was like, wow, like this is really going to be a thing. So this was probably the first couple of years that we were really at it. And I remember that there was a, a company that was all a painting company. Now you've heard the phrase like watching paint dry, not a very exciting thing, right? Mm -hmm. So they wanted to do an infographic and they're like, hey, you guys are the wizards, go do it. Here's what we do. And our paint is better than the other guys. And our guys are insured and they do better paint strokes. And I'm just so bored out of my mind listening to what they have to say. So we say, nah, that's not what we're going to do this on. We are going to educate the world on something better to help you own that industry. And indeed we did. And I, I can link to this later. We taught the world all about the psychology of color. And it went so yeah. far and so wide and so many people, millions and millions of people have seen this work. And even though it's probably eight or nine years old at this point, I think 
people still pin it on Pinterest every day, share it in social media every day. It was featured in National Geographic. It was in basically anybody that had to do with color psychology, interior design, mom blogs, real estate people, just examples of things that are good. It's been featured in multiple languages, textbooks, all this stuff. But I'll tell you, the week that that came out, both Adobe and Google just reached out to us out of nowhere. And they're like, we don't know what you did to that internet kid, but you're coming to work for us. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was a good day. Yeah. Good week. Yeah, absolutely. Good to get attention from those guys. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, Brian, it's time to wrap this up. What's the best way for my listeners to follow up and get in touch with you if they have any questions? You bet. So since I have a very common name, Brian Wallace... Usually when you look for Brian Wallace plus the name of my company, Now Sourcing, not outsourcing, but now sourcing, N-O-W, if you look up pretty much any social media network at Now Sourcing, you'll find me and us. And then if you just check us out at nowsourcing.com. And um, if you're looking for me on social, I mainly spend my social time on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me there and I'd love to talk with you all. Perfect. And yes, guys, Brian is, uh, he's pretty responsive on LinkedIn. I have to, I have to give him that. So definitely reach out to him there if you can. Brian, thank you one more time for, for coming on Dream Chasers. This has been awesome. My pleasure, Adam. Thank you for the opportunity. Guys, thank you for tuning in to Dream Chasers, interviews with the future. We will catch you in the next episode. Remember, in all you think, say, and do, take it to the next level.